I couldn't let this list slip by. As I was doing some analysis of some recent Warhammer 40k tournaments, I found a little bit of an odd Space Marine list that took down a GT. This is Antonio Mann's Iron Hands from the Granada War Lotus GT. Let's talk about this wild Iron Hands list, exactly what makes it tick, and the opponents that it faced over the course of the event. What's up, folks? Welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name is Trevi. Today we're talking about some Iron Hands. It's really nice to see Iron Hands doing so well on the competitive scene. I know I just talked to Fushini about his placing over at Kent War Games, not to mention the fact he actually just took down another Kent War Games GT, their August event. He 5 0 would with the Iron Hands list or the evolution of the Iron Hands list that I talked with him about in that video. And we're starting to see Iron Hands creep up in other places in the metagame as well. One of them being the Granada War Lotus GT, in which Iron Hands went 5 0, took first place with a bit of a wild list. Let's talk about this list, but before we get into it, real quick, if you enjoy this style of event breakdown, let me know down below by either dropping a comment, subscribing, liking the video, doing all of those things together really helps let me know what kind of content people enjoy. So if you like this coverage of weird and wacky lists from recent GTs, boom, do all those things and I'll keep doing it. But anyway, let's talk about Antonio Mann's list at the Granada War Lotus GT. First off, this is a 28 player tournament, not a very large GT, but it does grab right on the cusp of uh, being officially considered a uh, GT by the ITC. This one, wait for it, has no infantry in it. I mean, that's not technically true. There are HQ choices. And while it is technically possible to bring a Space Marine list with actually no infantry in it, it probably, you probably shouldn't do that. You should probably bring some HQs that aren't Damocles Command Rhinos. But this list is a single Vanguard detachment, not a battalion or patrol. We're gonna try to unlock as many really cheap elite slots as humanly possible. And it's led by two Primaris Tech Marines. One of them with the Tempered Helm to regenerate some CP. One of them with target protocols to give somebody a reroll to hit, wound, and damage. We also have the Ironstone on that guy to make one of the non-Dreadnought vehicles in the list minus one damage. So we get a little bit of a duty eternal in there as well. One thing to keep in mind, no infantry in this list besides those two characters and no rights of war on these guys either. So this list not only has no troops, Vanguard veterans, Blade Guard, all that stuff that normal Space Marine infantry that you're so used to seeing in these Space Marine lists, it also has no objective secured whatsoever. Plan A is to kill all your opponent's models. Can't hold objectives if you're dead. Anyway, I started blasting. In those elite slots, we have two Leviathan Dreadnoughts. These are kitted for DPS. Two Volkite Calivers on each of them. Three Hunter Killer Missiles, two Storm Cannon Arrays. We are trying to put as many shots downfield as we can with these things. With those Storm Cannon Arrays, each firing eight Auto Cannon Profile Shots, so Strength 7, AP1 for two damage. That's going to be putting 16 of those Auto Cannon Profile Shots downrange in addition to the two Volkite Calibers, which is an additional eight Strength 5 Volkite Shots at 30 inches. So we're firing a grand total of 24 attack out of each of these Leviathan Dreadnoughts in addition to their Hunter Killer Missiles. Pretty impressive weight of firepower if you want to clear some infantry at a pretty solid range. 36 or 30-ish inches for those Volkite Calivers. We also have three Redemptor Dreadnoughts. Nothing too surprising here. Each one with Storm Bolters, the Icarate Rocket Pod, Plasma Incinerators, and Gatling Cannons. So pretty flexible profile off of those Redemptors. They can shoot Plasma people. They can shoot all the little bitty guns at infantry. So they can kind of fill whatever role they need to. The rest of the list is very specialized into one role. We have two Storm Speed hammer strikes yeah this list is getting crazy by the way everyone the hammer strike is the storm speeder variant that brings a triple barreled multi melta it's a range 24 melta destroyer three shots at a melta profile so strength 8 ap4 for d6 damage with that melta ability it has crack storm grenade launchers so additional crack grenade profiles at 18 inches and a missile launcher that fires two flat three damage strength 8 ap3 missiles at 36 inches the hammer strike actually has the best damage profile out of all of the storm speeder variants against t7 targets specifically it loses out a little bit to the storm speeder thunder strike against t8 targets but against that t7 it's much better so if you're looking for kind of a mid-weight anti-armor weapon hammer strike is the place to be also gives you access to some easy engage in all fronts if you want to know where all the math i'm talking about with these storm speeders is coming from i actually ages and ages ago when the new space marine codex came out did a data sheet deep dive comparing all three storm speeder variants i'll link that video here it's 
It's actually a really interesting one. Another video you can check out in relation to this list is the comparison I did on all the Gladiator variants because we have two of them in this list. The list is bringing a Gladiator Reaper as well as a Gladiator Valiant. Both of them equipped with auto launchers to give them access to the smokescreen keyword, which means that everything in the list, except for the Redemptor Dreadnoughts, has access to a minus one to hit effect. The Storm Speeders can use the Land Speeder Stratagem to get minus one to hit, although I believe they have to advance if they do that, so they would have taken the turn off previously, which is unfortunate, but it is nice to have access to. Now, for those who don't know, the Gladiator Valiant actually has kind of a sick profile. It has a twin Laz Talon, which is a Laz Cannon profile that shoots four times at a 24-inch range. It is very very short range because the Sponson weapons are two multi meltas so we're firing a grand total of four last cannon shots and four multi melta profiles all at that 24 inch range bracket so as soon as this thing gets close to you it rips like 15 wounds off a t7 vehicle on average the amount of damage that gladiator valiants can do if you can deliver them is absolutely phenomenal the real question is delivering those guys because they don't have a lot of defensive tech involved but we are playing Iron Hand, so they do have a 6 plus damage ignore, they have access to all of that incredible repairing off of those Primaris Tech Marines, and we have access to the Iron Stone as well. So, if any list is going to do it, it's probably this one. Last but certainly not least, we have a Gladiator Reaper, I think probably my favorite version of the Gladiator, maybe the Valiant is cooler. The Valiant just seems conceptually really cool, because you could just rock it in and like blast a tank in half. But the Gladiator Reaper has a totally bespoke weapon called a Tempest Bolter, which is a bolt rifle configured like a hurricane bolter. It's a rapid fire four weapon with a bolt rifle profile. So at 15 inches, half of its 30 inch range, it's firing eight shots a piece and it has two of them for 16 strength, four shots, plus a twin heavy onslaught Gatling cannon. So another 24 strength, six AP one shots. This thing is gonna mow down some infantry against T3 or even T4 infantry. This guy kills so many models. And these two are gonna be perfect targets for those primary tech marine awaken the machine spirit buffs to give them plus one to hit because you're making so many freaking attacks either the eight really powerful shots out of the valiant or the potentially 40 pretty decent anti-infantry shots out of the reaper now the downside of the gladiator profile the really reason you don't see it very often is that a it's very expensive they're more expensive than almost any of these dreadnoughts valiant comes in at 245 points with that auto launchers upgrade this reaper build coming in at 220 that's a chunk of change and unfortunately the comparisons with dreadnoughts continue they are t8 which is a very big break point especially against enemy multi meltas and when you're combining that with the iron stone they certainly compare favorably to dreadnoughts but you do need to kind of combo out all of those things and when you're spending more points for a unit that is not core keyworded so it can't get rerolls it's a lot of times just not worth it not to mention the fact that they have no melee to speak of. They are only move 10, so they're not even particularly faster. They are repulsor field keyworded, so they can fall back and shoot with the repulsor field stratagem, which is very nice. But that's kind of a quality of life change when you would rather just kill whatever's engaging you with a Redemptor Dreadnought Fist. So I think you can sort of understand that this list is absolutely wild. When I saw that this list 5 and owed my brain leaked out of my ears. But let's talk about exactly the games that it played and the opponents that it played against to get to that 5-0. Now, before we get into the matchups proper, I do want to talk about the meta game of the GT quickly. Like I said before, this was a 28-person grand tournament and had a little bit of a non-standard meta. The overall population was absolutely dominated by not only Space Marines, but also other varieties of power armor. We saw eight Space Marine players at the event two Iron Hands, two Ultramarines, two Space Wolves, as well as a Salamander and a Blood Angels. We also saw three Necron players and three Custodes players. That's supplemented by two Grey Knights and two Death Guard. And the rest of the event was kind of distributed with one player from a bunch of different factions, including Drukhari, Admac, Orcs, Harlequins, Mixed Eldari. Interestingly, the big boogeyman of the metagame that we would normally see prey upon a list like this, those namely being things like Drukhari, and Adeptus Mechanicus didn't really see too much play, and they didn't really finish particularly highly either. So this was definitely a metagame primed to be taken by an off-the-wall Space Marine list. And definitely, if you know you're going into a metagame, that between Space Marines themselves, as well as Grey Knights, Death Guard, and Custodes, all of those really heavy 3-plus or 2-plus armor save kind of slow matchups, and you're looking at literally half the field being those, uh, those four factions represented 15 out of the 
eight players, teching into a bunch of anti-armor tanks makes a ton of sense. And it's definitely understandable that a list like this would do pretty well. First off in round one, Antonio played against Sergio Perez. Sergio was playing a Sagittarium Focus Custodes list. It was bringing a ton of Sagittarium Custodes, 15 in total, alongside some Prosecutors to perform actions, a bunch of Shield Captains, one in Terminator Armor, one on a Dawn Eagle Jet Bike, with the standard Dawn Eagle Jet Bike loadout. We also had a Vexilla Magnifica to keep all the Sagittarium Custodians alive, Virtus Praetors to Stooping Dive to whatever to comes in to try to engage them, as well as a Caladius Grav Tank, and Trajan Floris to further compound all of those rerolls you were giving it. Big old Custodes gun line. Now, unfortunately, the one thing that a Custodes gun line, being composed almost entirely of two damage weapons, doesn't want to see is an Iron Hands list built entirely out of models that ignore one point of damage every time you attack them. So I am not shocked that this came down to a 97-17 win for Antonio Mann. What are you going to do? All of your guns shoot half damage, and you're against an army that's going to absolutely trounce you with an immense volume of decently high AP 2 damage shooting. If you try to get into a shooting match with this Dreadnought list, you're just going to die. you got to approach it in some other way, and unfortunately, Sergio's list didn't really do that. Round 2, however, Antonio saw a much closer game against Yosu Isabal, who was a Space Wolf successor list using Born Heroes and Whirlwind of Rage to try to compound the number of exploding attacks that you get out of that Space Wolf Super Doctrine, so as soon as they move to Assault Doctrine, you're getting two hits off of each of those explosions, and you maintain the plus one to hit from the normal Space Wolf chapter tactic because you're taking those dead board heroes. Pretty interesting combo, especially when you combine it with the chaplain that's in the list who can throw out a Canticle of Hate to allow you to reroll any of your attacks that you want in melee, which means that you could potentially try to fish for those exploding sixes. Pretty interesting combo. Unfortunately, it was really only being used on one unit since the only big punchy melee unit that we saw in the list was a big unit of wolf guard that split its members between lightning claws and chain swords and storm shields the rest of the list was a smattering of land speeders suppressors a couple wolfen as well and the almost ubiquitous triple relic contemptor with twin volkite culverins that we see in most space marine lists these days not antonio's though it should be noted well i think the bones of this space wolf list are pretty strong and we can definitely see that scoring 70 points to antonio's 85 it did go down to his list and i'm not that surprised i don't think the relic contemptors has what it takes to do get out with other dreadnoughts especially without any support to make their cyclone missile launchers more consistent which is what iron hands can do especially with that target protocols for their own missile launchers not to mention the fact that the immense swath of two damage shooting coming out of those leviathan dreadnoughts can knock down units like wolfen or wolf guard without really much trouble and since you're putting a lot of the efficacy of your army in switching out your chapter tactic to buff those wolf guard as soon as those guys expose themselves and get killed by the leviathans you don't have too much going on for you so that put Antonio undefeated going into round three where he played against Salon who was also running Space Marines so two Space Marines in a row this time it was actually almost a mirror match we were seeing a Space Marine successor bringing Master Artisan's Whirlwind of Rage so a little bit of combat buffs in that chapter tactic the core of the Space Marine list was a bunch of Dreadnoughts three Redemptor Dreadnoughts these ones bringing twin Gatling Cannons we saw heavy onslaughts plus onslaught Gatling Cannons and that's actually a profile that is pretty scary to Antonio's list the double Gatling Cannon on the Redemptors allow them to put out a bunch of one damage pretty decent AP shooting which is what you need to tear apart enemy dreadnoughts and since those one damage weapons are going to ignore that duty eternal. We also saw some eliminator squads with last few seals and instigator carbines which I absolutely love. I wish we saw more last few seal eliminator squads around. Shout out to those death watch players out there who are taking units of four or five last few seal eliminators. I like that. Keep doing that. That's cool. Now, the core conceit of these Ultramarine builds are three Invictor Tactical Warsuits, these ones armed with twin Iron Hail Auto Cannons, and that allows you to use their Concealed Position deployment to place them way far up in your opponent's face. Then, if you lose the roll to go first, you can use Rapid Redeployment to pull those three Invictor Warsuits back to your normal deployment zone. Now, the downside is that if you lose the roll to go first, not only are you down a couple CP from the Rapid Redeployment, but you're also going to be placed suboptimally, since those Invictors aren't going to be able to use their Concealed Position deployment for the greatest benefit. It. Given that this game went 81 to 57 Antonio's way, I have a sneaking suspicion that he won that role. Losing the role to go first tends to go 
pretty poorly for Ultra Marines players who are banking on that combo. Since you're basically like playing the Raven Guard game plan where you go first and just put a bunch of your army really way up close to your opponent and then fight them. Except that you have a backup plan if you don't win the roll to go first, which is clearly more consistent than the standard Raven Guard game plan, but doesn't always work out. Especially since those Invictors, when compared to something like a Redemptor Dreadnought, sort of pale in the comparison. They only have three damage melee weapons, they don't have duty eternal, their toughness is lower, and they're also not core keyworded, so they don't get access to a lot of those rerolls. They're basically just a really crappy Dreadnought who pays for their cool concealed position deployment with a lot of that inefficiency. And that moved us on to round four, where Antonio played Kamani Rodriguez, who is playing, wait for it, another Space Marine, this time Salamanders. Kamani's list is very much what I would expect out of a Salamander's Space Marine list. I mean, it's just a very solid list. It's sort of a cookie cutter, very consistent style of Space Marine that's been very popular since the new Codex came out. We've got a Primaris Chaplain on a bike. We've got a Librarian, two Assault Intercessor squads, and an Incursor squad to fill out the troops options, three Aggressor squads, two Vanguard veterans, a Primaris Apothecary to keep them alive, as well as two units of attack bikes with multi meltas to make the best use out of that Salamander's Super Doctrine, as well as an Eradicator squad. I'd be interested to see how this game went. The big downside of this style of list, while I do appreciate that it has the Vanguard veterans, I think it could have gone a little bit harder into them because the, the big downside of Foot Salamanders is that it tends to be very slow. You're basically hinging your entire game plan off of those move five models. And if you don't have great terrain and you can't really shield yourself on the approach, the problem arises where if your opponent is able to deliver enough shooting to you, that Primaris Apothecary isn't saving you and not even the Salamander's defensive stratagems can do enough against the withering firepower that things like those Gladiators and those Leviathan Dreadnoughts can put down. That said, with access to Crucible of Battle and potentially a bunch of Melta weapons and one damage weapons with plus one to wound from multiple sources, once the Salamander's army gets stuck in with an Iron Hands army like the one Antonio was playing, it is absolutely lethal. Especially since we don't see something like Psychic Fortress in Antonio's list to protect his Redemptor Dreadnoughts against attacks like the Attack Bike Squads or the Eradicator Squads. Like I said before though, if you don't have great terrain and you overextend with those multi meltas before the time is right, where the Iron Hands get line of sight to them and are able to remove them before they're able to deal the maximum damage. That game ended up going down to a pretty close 87-62 victory in Antonio's favor and put him into the final round where he played a mirror match. Now this might be the greatest mirror match of all time, because not only was it an Iron Hands mirror match, it was also an Antonio mirror match, because he was paired against Antonio Rivera's Iron Hands successors. In this case, Blood Ravens were chosen as the successor keyword with Inheritors of the Primarch to give them the Iron Hands chapter tactic. This is technically legal according to the Blood Ravens Codex supplement. While they already have their own chapter tactic, which gives them the mini transhuman effect so that you only are wounded on a 3+, plus instead of a 2+, plus and you can reroll ones on your psychic tests. The supplement does state that that chapter tactic is optional and you can instead choose to supplement it with any other chapter tactic. Now, all that being the case, I don't think that we've actually used any of the Blood Raven specific abilities in this construction. I might be wrong about that, but it looks like he could have just played regular Iron Hands and gotten away with it. That might have been a flavor thing, and he has his models painted as Blood Ravens and didn't want to just call them Iron Hands, which, I mean, that's totally fair. That's kind of why Inheritors of the Primarch exists in the first place. But moving on, this list actually looks pretty similar to Antonio Mann's. We do have troops. It is built out of a battalion detachment, bringing two Assault Intercessor squads and an Infl Trader squad. This one actually upgraded with a Helix Gauntlet, probably to, to fill some additional points. We also have a Primaris Librarian in addition to the Tech Marine leading it. This guy is bringing Psychic Fortress, which is going to be good to protect the three Redemptor Dreadnoughts that are forming the core of the list. One of them has been upgraded with March of the Ancients to get all the All Flesh's Weakness Warlord trait, which gives it a 5 plus damage ignore instead of the 6 plus. Now, it is important to note that you cannot use Reject the Flesh, Embrace the Machine on that Redemptor Dreadnought because that does specify infinite. Infantry. I know that's a popular combo people like to talk about to get a 4 plus damage ignore, but it is in fact not legal. We also have two Invictor Warsuits. Interestingly, we also have two Invictor Warsuits in this list as well as three attack bikes and, wait for it, two Gladiator Reapers. What is happening right now? I wish I could play in this event. They had four Gladiators on the final table of this tournament. That's so sick. Now, I'm going to level with you, chat. The Twin Gladiator Iron Hands versus Twin Gladiator Blood Ravens matchup is not one that I know inherently off the top of my head. But at the end of the day, it ended up going to Antonio Mann, 91 to 62. 
With the Blood Ravens list sporting those Invictor War suits, those I think tend to be the weak link in the matchup. They do sport a lot of two damage attacks. It gets cut in half by the damage reduction on all of Antonio Man's Dreadnoughts. In addition, the Gladiator Reapers, well, they're good at getting around Duty Eternal. They are not good at getting around a Gladiator Valiant that will absolutely rip both of those things in half while taking minimal damage in return. So I have to imagine that the very heavy skew that Antonio Man built into his list certainly helped in this case. His opponent had a wide variety of attacks, not only a couple multi meltas and Redemptor Dreadnoughts, but also a lot of anti-infantry and mid-weight shooting from those Invictor Tactical Warsuits and the Gladiator Reapers, and he's able to shrug almost all of that simply by the fact that he didn't bring any infantry. His list is all Dreadnoughts and huge Toughness 8 tanks. But that put him at 5-0 and at the end of the event and made him the victor of the Granada War Lotus GT. You can tell why Antonio earned his surname in this event because he is the man bringing this wild iron hands list to a gt and going 5-0 with it huge congratulations to antonio for the result and a lot of these games and matchups seemed absolutely wild i would have loved to have been a fly on the wall at this event because it looks like a meta game totally divorced from what we normally see in what is widely considered sort of the quote-unquote standard meta game of warhammer 40k Definitely goes to show you that beyond just checking your list for being the most optimal, you also have to be able to respond to whatever local metagame you're playing in. And it certainly seemed like Antonio did that, playing against a lot of Space Marine lists with very heavily armored vehicles and having a list that was teched out pretty well to be able to deal with them. But that's all I have to say about this list, everyone. Thanks for watching, and huge congratulations again to Antonio for taking down the Granada War Lotus GT with two gladiators in his list. I really wanted to talk about this super cool Iron Hands list, so everybody in the comment section give Antonio some hype. Otherwise, huge thanks to all the people who make Tactical Tortoise possible, YouTube channel members, Twitch, subscribers, Patreon, patrons, all those people are phenomenal, and you know what? You're also phenomenal for listening all the way to the end of the video. Thanks so much, and remember to keep it classy, folks, and have happy wargaming.